Hey everybody, welcome back to HPC Tech Shorts, the engineering water cooler here in AWS in HPC Engineering. Joined today by Nathan Stornetta in Seattle. Hey Nathan. Hey Boof, how's it going? Not too bad. Nathan is the senior product manager uh, looking after Parallel Cluster and we've got something pretty cool to announce today, right? Super excited to announce that uh, we're introducing a new major version of Parallel Cluster. That is Parallel Cluster 3.0 which represents a significant step forward for the product um, and has a lot of features and enhancements that we're super excited to share with customers. In the fall of 2018, we launched officially Parallel Cluster, rebranding CFN Cluster into this new product. We put a full, fully staffed development team behind it and tried to make it, again, more production ready, hardened uh, and usable for customers with a variety of circumstances. We've now had a couple of years to build on that experience with Parallel Cluster and taking a lot of customer feedback to understand where it is we still needed to progress. Thousands of conversations, hundreds yeah. upon hundreds upon hundreds of conference calls with customers, mm -hmm. digging into the detail to actually turn all of that stuff back into product features. And we really do work backwards from that, that customer you know, specification. Absolutely. Right? That I, I, problem with yeah, to that, yeah, that, that can't be overstated here, right? Like this is, this has been a very deliberate process. Like, like you say, that's, that's the, uh, the product really of those hundreds and hundreds of customers that have given us feedback over these last few years. And overwhelmingly, what we found is that while we had a certain class of customers and use cases in mind for Parallel Cluster, largely, uh, I would say, researchers and small teams that you know wanted to escape the constraints of their on-premises infrastructure, we found that the adoption has even grown beyond what we anticipated. A lot of enterprise customers and partners are wanting to use mm -hmm. this product and are using it today. And so with Parallel Cluster 3, we've built in a lot of new features and additions to cater towards this group of uh, not just researchers, but now increasingly builders, right, who want to treat Parallel Cluster not just as this kind of end-to-end -end cluster configuration tool and deployment tool, but really more of an HPC fundamental building block in their overall larger workflows. There's a blog post out today. Everybody be able to see it uh, if you go to the AWS HPC blog. I will put the URL on the bottom of the screen and it'll also be in the in the show notes for, for all of this content as well. Um, let's go through some of those some of those changes. I guess actually the first thing people are going to notice is going to be one of the first things that customers may notice is that we have introduced a number of changes to the way that clusters themselves are configured. On the left hand side, you can see a, a very standard kind of version two of parallel cluster that configuration. You have these different blocks here of uh, different uh, configuration types of settings, right? With the global settings, as well as uh, things in the AWS region, like the region, uh, settings specific to the cluster itself, the networking, shared storage, and, and so on. You used to be able to define multiple clusters in one config file. We found overwhelmingly a lot of customers telling us that while that was interesting flexibility, they ended up kind of shooting themselves in the foot with that. Yes. Sometimes, sometimes too much flexibility is-, is I, I'm dangerous. one of those customers that used to shoot myself in the foot yeah, regularly. I, I, I think I've, I've been there myself. And, and so- I got sore feet, so- <laughs> Yeah, so so what we have here, right? Like in, in some sense, the, the simplicity of the left-hand side configuration, it betrays us here because it, it all looks so easy. Um, beginning in Parallel Cluster 3, all configuration files are now required to adopt a, a YAML specification, right? So we're imposing structure in terms of how this file um, is, is formatted, right? And tr doing our best now to help you keep these in a more maintainable, readable format uh, as customers, right? You'll also notice that we've, we've rearranged some of these kind of blocks of settings. Uh, one specific thing that I'll call attention to right here, if you go down towards the bottom booth uh, in this like shared storage section, yeah. whereas previously we had di entirely different settings for EFS, for FSX, and for, for S3, right? We're, we're trying to consolidate more of these kinds of settings into um, shared sections, right? Built around the use cases that customers actually have more so than the products, right? Which may not even be yep. familiar to customers at, at first blush, right? And so here we have, for example, this shared storage section. 
There are multiple different types of shared storage that a customer can choose to adopt, right? And we want to unify the idea of this is the section where you keep all of that information, right? Even if you may use multiple different types of shared storage for different purposes, EFS, Elastic File System, and FSx for Luster, for example, uh, for your high performance versus your um, uh, maybe your application storage or setting storage, things like that. So um, we've still got the we've still got the configuration tool, right? So that folks can get stepped through an automatic thing that generates this file. They don't have to know how to type YAML from, from scratch. That's correct, yeah. And I think that that's the typical use case that I see most customers following. And I'd recommend it to anyone who is new to Parallel Cluster or making a transition to, to Parallel Cluster 3 is you can, from this, the command line interface, you can just type in pcluster configure, which kickstarts our configuration wizard and helps walk you through some of the key choices in terms of compute settings, um, uh, networking settings and so on, and then pre-populates this file. One one thing I'll also just mention: we recognize that you know because there are some changes here, and you may already have existing Parallel Cluster two configuration files. We are hard at work on on developing some uh, utilities to make that conversion easier. The next so thing we really want to talk about: let's talk about APIs because. <laughs> Uh, Parallel Cluster's got an, a RESTful API now. With Parallel Cluster 2, um, we offered a single way of interacting with these clusters, uh, you know, configuring them, uh, deploying them, managing them. And that was through our command line interface. Now, in Parallel Cluster 3, we still offer that same command line interface for customers that, that like to interact with their clusters in that way. But in addition, one of the key things that we've heard from a lot of customers is they were looking for ways to interact uh, with these clusters in a fashion that was not as interactive, that could be better scripted or or made more programmatic. Um, we've heard that in particular from a lot of uh, partners and builders, right? Customers who are looking to really make solutions and services on top of Parallel Cluster, and they want to, you know, do things even even like uh, creating their own front end interfaces on on top of the product, right? With Parallel Cluster three, that's exactly a, a new mode of operation that we've enabled. Uh, with the same kinds of functionality that can be executed through the, the command line interface today with Parallel Cluster 2. Customers can create, update, delete, stop their clusters through those HTTP endpoints, giving them more yep. flexibility in the ways that they want to go about doing that. But the idea of an HPC cluster as code, the ability to write some code to cause an HPC cluster to come into existence, Man, you just see the 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 crazed look in most people's eyes when they realize the power that gives them to just invent things. This is the ultimate endpoint of that creative process. Folks mm -hmm. can now spin up a cluster when a data set arrives from an instrument and automatically create a cluster to process the data, throw the cluster away when they're done. Mm -hmm. um, and so the API, that all of that becomes possible. Here, there's an API inside Slurm. Customers could easily be writing user interfaces. And, th and these customers would be the kind of builders that we would often find out in partners, partners like Ronan, for example, mm -hmm. right, where they've wrapped an entire user interface around the HPC clustering experience. We've now made it possible to do more of that right on. Um, so, um, so the next thing, because of course, it's kind of related to that, Custom armies. What we just talked about with the API, it's important, you know, that infrastructure as code component is critical, right? And I think we've made a lot of advances there. Beyond just the infrastructure as code component in terms of the cluster architecture, though, there's really this key component of the software environment, right, in which customers actually land once the once the cluster is there. And I think, you know, we talked to a lot of customers who They've, uh, you know, in, in operating in their on-premises environment, they have a very particular software stack that they are used to, that they need, mm -hmm. that they rely on for, for these production workloads that they're running. Customers do this in their enterprise environments. They have, they have base armies that they work with and they have built up, or, or, you know, automation techniques to actually produce the, the multiple variants of that they need for the different use cases. We were just starting to become a bit of an outlier and there's no reason for that because we AWS provided EC2 Image Builder, um, and and you know customers were jumping on that thing to actually make use of it to 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 automate those pipelines. So, with our new custom AMI building process, we leverage EC2 Image Builder, making it possible for customers to uh, you know specify their own kind of 
EC2 image builder components that can be layered into a, a parallel cluster compatible uh, AMI, right? And so, um, you know, I think that gives flexibility for customers who are looking to do like a variety of different things from, you know, applying certain uh, stig like hardening, security like hardening steps on top of their, their cluster images to providing very specific software that they're looking for, right? Whether that's open source packages like, like Wharf or, or, or Namdi, or whether it's, you know, in, in ensuring that you have the latest version of, of Python or R installed in your cluster. And there's a there's a suite of commands inside the P cluster command set that'll actually help you manage the images once you've created them, see mm -hmm. where they're available and so forth. Um, all of this is good. Um, okay, so, so Nathan, Let's talk about some of the changes and some of the things that we're not carrying over from mm -hmm. uh, Parallel Cluster 2 to Parallel Cluster 3. And I think the, the, main, the main topic to talk about there is, is schedulers, some of the schedulers. Specifically, we no longer provide support for SGE or Torque. Um, and to highlight I would, what I would say is the key reason for that is SGE and Torque, they are both open source scheduler projects that uh, for some time had a lot of you know, backing and active development and support. But now over the last several years have really fallen to a state of, of not being maintained by any um, open source maintainers or, or commercial backers. Yeah, and I think um, there's, been, there's been no check-ins almost at all into SGE's code base for years. Five, five or six years, I would say. Five or um, six years, right. Yeah. And that's a risk, and, right? That actually, that's a that's a problem from our point of view from a security stance, yeah? It, it does create a problem from our, our point of view. I, I think as with any kind of software, right, there is a uh, bit rot sets in after a period of time, right? And there is a need for that ongoing maintenance to ensure that patches are provided and security is kept up to a high standard. That's super important to us at AWS. Security is always going to be our first priority, right? And as we've seen, you know, more and more customers with an enterprise mindset adopting Parallel Cluster, you know, we want to continue raising the security bar that we have for them as well, where we know that they have exacting standards on the security. Well, people. and also keep in mind that um, software that's published out on the internet, you know, the source code's visible to all, you know, vulnerabilities are discovered and new attack vectors are discovered in software every single day. And that's really what, that that's why there is so much that's why it's so important for open source projects to maintain can, you know, continuous development to make sure that they're always keeping up with those things, always keeping you know, tight security practices. Yeah. And something that hasn't been touched for five, six years, uh, it was getting hard for us to, to, to put a secure wrapper around that to keep the world and keep all of our customers safe from, you exactly. know, from what was going on there. Exactly. So we had to make a choice, right? Yeah, we had to make a choice, right? I think um, both in thinking through what the current state is today, as well as anticipating, like you're saying, of the future of, of those kinds of open source projects, right? And so we made a hard choice, like you say. We recognize that there are customers who have been using SGE and, and Torque. Um, however, you know, we want to be in a position where we support the best uh, schedulers that have a strong community behind them and where we can provide strong assurances around you know the, the security profile both today and in the future of, of those kinds of things right. so now we detail matters here so we we signaled to customers maybe 12 months ago or more that we were making this move with with you know in parallel cluster to to um, move away from SGE and torque we indicated to them we're going to support Parallel Cluster 2 with SG and Torque until the end of this year, correct? Yes, that's correct. So we'll continue to support customers running SG and Torque with Parallel Cluster 2 through the end of this year. Uh, so there's still time to, to make that migration. Uh, in addition, I think it's also worth calling out while we're on the topic, right, that for Parallel Cluster 2, uh, more generally, right, we introduced earlier this year a feature stable version of the product, right? And the support for that product will continue until the end of next year, right? So, so the for end customers, of 2022. Correct, till the end of uh, 2022. So for customers right. that are in a position where they're still looking to take some time or, or be, need to be a little bit more deliberate in their transition across Parallel Cluster 2 to Parallel Cluster 3, uh, they have they have some time right to move at their own pace uh, while we continue to provide support for that version of Parallel Cluster Two, specifically the 2.11 minor version, uh, where we'll continue to ship bug fixes, security patches, and updates 
uh, right. uh, on a recurring basis to later next year. So nobody needs to have a heart attack yet, but it is time to finally get moving away from SGE and Torque. That's right. Yes. As, yeah. as we've been saying for some time now, right, it, it really is time to move away from SGE and Torque. And well, yeah. we may need to rip, you may be ripping off the Band-Aid in some sense. We think it's uh, to, to end up in a much better place overall. But but in terms of, you know, but this is not the last word on schedulers, right? You know, we've we've just we've just gone through the process of, of shifting the way that we we build parallel cluster. We've done a major re-architecture of the internals of parallel cluster and we've yep. you know put a lot of APIs in place internally. We're in a better position to support future, you know, future scheduler additions to the to the world, right? Our architecture puts us in a position where that scheduler piece, uh, I think, is is going to be a key thing um, where we anticipate, you know, customers will be able to to build things of their own, right, uh, for parallel cluster to adapt to their own scheduling um, needs. So we've got a workshop. Uh, we have a workshop up online uh, that will give you step-by-step -step guidance. You've already seen some of the screenshots from it, but the workshop is up available online. It'll help you step-by-step -step build a parallel cluster and use some of the new features in parallel cluster and show you how they work. People can still build, in fact, easier than ever. They can build parallel clusters with visualization tools built in, high-performance parallel file systems, uh, access to, to S3, the the surely the biggest object data store known to man. Uh, and and they can keep building big scalable clusters, but this time with code. I think we've we've covered a lot already, so maybe I won't add too much there. I, I just want to say again and, and just reiterate, right, that I think there's, um, like I said, we've, we've made a lot of changes here, hearing what customers have to say, but we're not stopping here, right? We have a lot of things still in the pipeline right now that we are, I, I can't wait to share with uh, the HPC Tech Short community, as well as, you know, the broader community of HPC builders and customers on AWS. Um, and they're coming soon. And like I said, can't wait to show them to everybody. Awesome. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Boof. Always a pleasure.